Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Friends and saunterers, we're on Solomon's last chapter of his grand experiment today, uh, chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. And well done, everyone. I'm trying to sit in such a way that I don't get the sun in my eyes. And I've got a pink dressing gown hanging up behind me, which is novel, which is not mine. <laughs> I hasten to add. Um, let's pray and then we'll launch in. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for this grand experiment and for all that it's taught us so far. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to speak to us today and just open our hearts to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. Let's put this somewhere. So, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Good morning, 40. Good morning, Sarah and Joan and John and Anna and Fliss and Hayes. So good to see you all. He says this most profound statement. Chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. And so Solomon is kind of pulling together the thoughts from the last chapter. He was saying, wasn't he, rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in all the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And so now he really is bringing God back into the equation in a much more intentional, purposeful way. So the preacher, Coelet, um, the teacher, uh, Solomon the Wise, is now trying to make a very wise point from his um, grand experiment and all the lessons he's learned. And he says, verse chapter 12, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. And I would like to say that I have had some um, sad conversations with elderly people who have told me a similar kind of thing. I've got no pleasure. There's nothing really here for me anymore. I would much rather go to be with the Lord because that's where my hope is. That's, that's what I've been living for. And now... Everything hurts. Someone, one of my elderly friends said to me once, old age brings with it lots of unwelcome companions. And it's quite sad, isn't it? Good morning, Kev and Fran and Sandy and Lorraine. It's sad when we um, see our older friends suffering with physical ailments and all the rest of it. And I think the point that Solomon is making, and there is a very good point, sometimes it might seem a little bit unspiritual to say it, but I think it is easier to enjoy God and life and the universe when our body feels all right, when it doesn't hurt. When our body is aching, it's actually quite difficult to think about anything other than the pain, isn't it? And we have to develop skills to kind of tune out the pain and all this kind of thing. And um, someone once famously said, I think William Booth, the, the founder of the Salvation Army once said, don't try and preach the gospel to somebody who's got toothache. So like, don't try and tell them the good news of Jesus when they've got toothache, because all they can think about is their tooth hurting. And uh, good morning, Denise. And so that's a really, really important point. And so, but the problem is when we're young, there's so much to be done, isn't there? And there's so much adventure to be had and we've had young people grow up in church and then they start to have a relationship and they want to get off and do the things that young people want to do when they fall in love. And they don't want to particularly wait until they're married before they start enjoying the fruits and they want to get going and enjoy it all now. And then they feel a bit awkward about coming to church and they don't want to look me in the face because I'm so scary and all those kinds of things. And... And it, it kind of, time travels, time passes, doesn't it? And we have children and stuff and work and we're trying to get this com um, promotion. So we've got to work really hard for that. And we've got to study to get these exams so that we can move up the pay grade. And then we have more responsibility, more hours of work 
for a bit more money so we get a nicer holiday but a rubbishier family life and it's sort of life drives us on and there's always something else and if as long as we're putting it off and procrastinating and saying I'll deal with that when I'm older and I really genuinely do believe that some people think that they'll find God when they'll look for God when they're old and they've got time and all the rest of it and Solomon is saying don't fall for that one young person even you child because he says the dawn of life it's so short, didn't he? He said that yesterday, we saw that yesterday. He said, the youth and the dawn of life are vanity. They're like a vapour. They are here today, gone tomorrow. And we've said and laughed about it, haven't we? We look in the mirror and we see, oh my word, where did all those lines come from? I'll take my glasses off, then I won't see them. But then I can't see what I'm doing. I cut my nose when I'm shaving or something, you know what I mean? And so he's saying, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now, this was drummed into me by my parents. And you know what? I'm really glad it was because I <laughs> got very wonderfully, by God's kindness, I've had all these years of my life to enjoy him, to walk with him and to have him answer my prayers and to discover the wonder of his beauty and his nature and I'm still on that journey but I'm farther along that journey now than I was when I started out. I have a friend who's watching Joan and when she came to the Lord I think she was in her 40s so when she discovered Jesus she was in her 40s and she was looking back on a, a failed marriage and quite a bit of heartache and she said she cried for a whole year. And her cry was, oh God, why didn't you let me find you sooner? Why did I have to go through all of this? Why did I have to find you now? It's great that I have, but I've only I'd found you sooner. And that's a... So anyway, here we go. So that's verse one. He said, before the evil day comes, before the days of trouble kick in, and that's all you can think about, before... The fact of your multiple diagnosis um, is all you can jolly well think about and you say I have no pleasure in them. Now he goes on into a beautiful but somewhat painful poetic description of what old age is like and see if you can spot the metaphors as I read it and then we'll go we'll skim back over it. Verse 2 he says I'm just going to read this chap this this section down. He says before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and no one rises up at the sound, sorry, and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of Psalm are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets because before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Vapour of vapours, puff of smoke, all is a vapour, all is a kind of gust of warm air. It's and a breath and it's gone. So what he's saying here is um, he's describing the aging process and he's describing an old person with kind of very vivid poetic imagery. Good morning, Alison. And so he talks about the, the light of the sun and the moon and the stars being darkened is because the eyesight is failing and the clouds are coming over the vision and so things are not clear and sharp and in focus anymore they're all just like blurred and I don't know glaucoma or cataracts or something are clouding the vision and making it hard to see 
And then he says, when the key in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the you know, you think about the hands that do everything, don't they? They open the door of the house and you see older person with a tremor and it's oh it's sad, isn't it? And they they used to be a strong person. They used to grab life by the throat and live it large and then and they get old. I don't doesn't don't you find it moving when you see the old guys like uh, whoever I've forgotten all his titles now but Sir Sir Major Captain Tom or whatever his name is and dear guy and the other guy who was on the other day who was a Spitfire pilot and just a beautiful old man but in in their 90s and they were they were young guys full of beans full of life full of testosterone getting out there and fighting for our country and giving their very best and laughing and joking and in the face of danger and taking it on the chin and oh, grieving the loss of their their friends as they went down and all this kind of thing. And yet now they're old and they're weak and they need someone to help them get along and oh my. And, it, and it's sad, isn't it? Old age is a toughie. The grinders cease because they're few. It's like your teeth are falling out, so you haven't got many grinders in the mill anymore. And uh, the ones looking through the window are dimmed. Again, that's the eyesight. The doors of the street are shut, and the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird. So, like, you're asleep, but just a bird is enough to wake you up. And you <laughs> sleep in the day, you don't sleep at night. There's a whole... Hours and hours and hours of wakefulness, lying in bed or sitting in your chair watching John Wayne on TV, and it's like oh, God, this is so bad. And he said the they they're afraid of the the song the all the daughters of song are brought low. There's no singing going on. There's no joy in their voice. Good morning, Chris. Um, they're afraid of what's high. Terror's in the way, so they just. Where they would have just gone out boldly, they would be cautious, taking very careful steps with a stick or maybe two or a Zimmer frame or something. And the grasshopper is like drags itself along that little critter that's normally so full of beans, boing, flies up, catapults itself in the air. And the old guy or the old woman feels like that. It's like, oh, I drag myself along. And I used to be like a grasshopper, literally springing my step. And desire fails, as interesting that one, because the actual Hebrew is a word there is caperberry. And apparently, I'm told, caperberry is an aphrodisiac. So it's a way of try, kind of if your desire is a little bit flagging sexually, you can take the caperberry and it sort of sparks you up again and puts you back in the game and <laughs> gives you something to anyway get you going and he says even that doesn't work when you get old and it's like you're thinking oh my let's not even think about it but it's like you the the desire of failing I, that is a big thing for a for a man or a woman to feel like their libido has gone that thing that they had to work so hard to control when they were younger is like no whiff of it anymore one little glimmer of testosterone or whatever would be welcome and it's gone and he says before the silver cord is snapped and these are just in these are just kind of poetic analogies of life the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern it's like it doesn't work anymore a golden bowl that's broken is broken isn't it is in two bits or six or twenty it's no good and the cistern that you can't get water out of is, oh. And he says, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And so we have that sense, don't we, that this life is so short, it's fleeting, and it will return to God. And he's just told us, and he tells us again at the end, that we will face judgment. And so Solomon, for all his kind of humanistic way of looking at things, with just this world's just using a brain and just using this world's light, he can't resist coming back to the actual point, which I suppose one might say qualifies this really to appear in the canon of scripture, the 
the collection of writings that we consider inspired by God. <laughs> Hayes, poor Hayes. I think it's your go now. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 that sense that God, we will stand before God and there will be a judgment. All of this will, all of this life will be reckoned up and it will count. And it's going to be whether we've received Jesus or not, whether we've said yes to God's open door of salvation whilst we're alive. And so come back again to verse one. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. While you've got a chance, while you've got compass mentis, while everything works up here, use that to make a conscious decision to surrender your life to God, to surrender your life and accept the offer of Jesus' salvation because it's in this life that we have that opportunity and then this life finishes and that, my friends, is the door of opportunity closing, I'm sad to say. And so verse, so he's saying, and it is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He's not saying it's all pointless. He's saying it's all very short, very brief, and it can seem pointless. But the point is that in this life, in this brief breath of life that we have, we should encounter God and we should be um, accept his invitation to become part of his glorious family. Verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So he, this was Solomon trying to be bring delight. It actually, <laughs> some of his other stuff does and we'll, we'll get into the Song of Solomon shortly and we'll see the delight in there. And that is a book of packed full of delight. So that's something to look forward to. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They're given by one shepherd. Interesting, one shepherd, that great shepherd of the sheep. That's Jesus, isn't it? He is the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The shepherd has been actually shepherding us even through the, um, the kind of grand experiment of Ecclesiastes, God, the great shepherd, has been kind of herding us, if you like, through the wisdom of this world, through the thinking of this world and funneling us into that place where we see there really is a point to it all. There absolutely is. And that point is that we should know God and we should know him from an early age, if we possibly can, and embrace his plans for our life. And he says, the words of the wise are like goads. Well, a goad was a sharp stick or a stick with metal prongs on it that you used to shove into the, <laughs> shove into the back end of an oxen to make it walk when it was feeling like it wanted to have a stop and sniff the flowers and you wanted it to plough your field, you jab it up the jacksy with your your um, goad, boom, and this animal whose feeling is somewhat kind of less <laughs> acute than a human being, is a bit more like a rhino. He needs a bit of a poke sometimes to get him moving, and that's what the ox goads are for. And he says, actually, the words of the wise are like goads, and sometimes we need to be prodded a little bit and to <laughs> steered along to get us to move forward in a good direction. And he says, they are goads and they're like nails firmly fixed, are the collected sayings. They're, they're words of wisdom. They're there to instruct us. They're secure, they're strong and helpful. So he's pitching his own book. He's writing the kind of the, um, what do you call it? Testimony, oh, what is it on the back of a book when people, uh, endorsement, he's writing his own endorsement here on the back of his book. And um, just in case no one did it for him, he says, my son, be aware of anything else beyond of anything beyond these of making many books. There is no end and much study is weariness of the flesh. Now, we know that, don't we? People are still writing books, myself included, and it's like still going on and it will go on and on and on. There will be no end of it. As long as there are people on the earth, we'll be writing books, we'll be compiling sayings and we'll be 
pooling our wisdom and kind of putting out there our ideas. And he said, there will be no end of that. And actually much study makes you tired. It really does. Verse 13, the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, here's an interesting point. Excuse me. He says this is the whole duty of man. He doesn't say anything about the joy and the reward of walking with God and intimacy with God. What he's saying is actually we have a duty. We're on the earth. We have a duty to God. And that is to fear him. He doesn't say anything about loving God. He doesn't say anything about intimacy or the promise of what happens if we do honour God with our lives and we do enter into his eternal rest when this life's done. He doesn't even go there. And it may be because this is Solomon in a and towards the end of his life, when he's lost some of the spark of it all, what a tragedy if that's true. But nonetheless, he kind of wraps up this incredible panoramic view, if you like, of the human condition using pretty much the natural mind to analyse it and reflect on it. And he asks some of the questions that people will ask you and I when we talk to them about Jesus and when we engage with them about eternal things, they'll ask us some of the same questions and they'll make some of the same statements that Solomon's made, but perhaps using different words. Um, but at the end of it, all well, he says, well, if we reduce it right down to its most basic level, we have a duty. And that is to surrender our lives to God and live for him, fear him. And God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that is so true. We went in the marriage service, one of the, um, when we're setting people up for the, you know, we're going to we say these vows are going to be made in the sight of God. And he knows every secret thing, doesn't he? Good morning, Raymond. Great to see you. He knows every secret that's going on in our hearts. We cannot fool him. And one day, we will all stand. Paul the Apostle says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all stand before God. And so here's the admonition of the preacher. Here's the point of it all. Is Good morning, Michael. Is to remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now, if you're already in your 40s or 50s and 60s and you kind of think objectively, I'm not that young anymore. Still do it now. Do it now. Get on your knees. Say, Jesus, will you come into my life? Will you forgive me for all of my waywardness, all of my living for me-ism? And I want to surrender my life now to you for the rest of my life. And I trust you that when this life is done, there will be a beautiful life waiting for me with you forever. Amen. Have an amazing day. Watch this space. We will be starting the Song of Songs soon. I just need a little bit more time of reflection before I launch into such a challenging and beautiful, glorious book. So it's been so much fun. Um, we've sauntered through over a hundred pages in my Bible since lockdown, which has been great fun. And thank you so much for everyone who's come with me and helped me to make the effort. God bless you. Lots of love to you.